We need to switch for tomorrow, and he needs to go with the Spanish, and I'll come over here with the English tomorrow then. <laughs> you know, I was thinking uh, earlier, JD, when he got up here and came up with that hammer and kept it there for a long time, I was getting a little worried. He didn't know what he was going to do with it. So uh, I was thinking about asking him to borrow it for right now, just in case anybody starts falling asleep so I can pound on it, you know, wake you all up. Uh, I'm always thankful for... Uh, being a part of the lectureship and here in spring. And as always, I am thankful to the elders of this congregation, to David, Ken, John, their families, and of course the rest of the congregation for uh, the trust that they have in me to take a part as one of the speakers in uh, doing not only on this lectureship, but a few of the lectureships in the, the years past. When uh, we think of the Apostle Paul uh, in his epistle to the Philippians, chapter 3, and verse 1, just by summarizing some of the things that he said or the message that he's trying to convey, we see that the Apostle Paul tells him in so many words that he did, didn't see it as a burden to have to repeat the same things to them which he already told them in the past. And the reason for that is because he believes that it was good for them to be reminded of those things from time to time because it was good for them to help them to remain faithful to the Lord. Now, when we think of the lectureship for this year, Lessons on Christian Living, we can say the same thing, that it is good for us to be reminded of each of the five lessons that have already been presented this morning from time to time so that we are reminded to remain faithful to the Lord. Adding to those five that have already been presented, there is one more, which is the one that has been assigned to me. Examine yourself. Now, I will ask you to please open your Bibles in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. And this is the scripture that we are going to use this afternoon as the reference scripture for the, the topic that has been assigned to me. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. And when you open your Bibles there, if you have a marker or anything, I'm going to ask you to keep it on that scripture because we're going to keep coming back to it uh, as we continue to move in our lesson. So again, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, the scripture says as follows, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. When we look at the Apostle Paul and the message that he gives to the members of the church in Corinth, he is asking them to examine themselves. Now again, that is the topic that has been assigned to me for this afternoon or for this final lesson. And... The way that I would like to present this topic is by asking some questions to the title that has been given to this lesson, Examine Yourself. Now, the first question that I would like to ask, and each one of those questions is going to serve as the main points that we're going to touch on this lesson. So the first question would be, why do I need to examine myself? What is the purpose behind it? What is the reason that I should be examining myself. Second, or the second question, which, which will serve as the second point, how do I examine myself? That means that there has to be a method, there has to be a way in which God prescribes in the Bible as to how I am to examine myself. And the number three, if we already know why and how to examine ourselves, we will certainly reach a certain conclusion, which we will ask a third question. Our third point will be, what do I do after I examine myself? So with that in mind, we will begin our lesson asking the first question, why do I need to examine myself? When we go back to that text that we just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, you will see that the very first line says, examine yourselves Notice the very next, next part of that paragraph, whether ye be in the faith. So the Apostle Paul is already telling me the reason as to why I need to examine myself. And the reason that he is giving me is that I need to know whether or not I am in the faith. 
meaning whether or not I am approved before God if I am walking according to the will of God, according to his word. And in order to do that, let me just point out uh, as the first thing that I want to point out that the words that we find here in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, originally those were words that were directed to the members of the church in Corinth. Now we know that specifically those words were directed to some of the members in that congregation that were living in some type of sin, who needed to repent, who needed to get right with God. And also we know that we can apply that same text to us today, and we can find out the reason as to why we need to examine ourselves, and that's to ascertain whether we are in the faith as well, and whether or not we are living according to the will of God. And you may ask, why is it important that I examine myself to know if I am approved before God? Well, the reason for that is because we have mentioned in the past uh, in other lessons that there are many people today, and it has been said throughout this lectureship, that there are many people today that think that they are right before God, that they think that they have a relationship with God, that they think that everything is good between them and God, but the truth is that they are not right with God. And we can see some examples of that in the Bible. For instance, we can turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and verse 23. And here, our Lord Jesus Christ, he speaks of some people that thought that they were right with him. But when they came to judgment day, they found out that it was not so. Notice what we read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. It says, many will say to me in that day. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. See, the reason why it is so important that we examine ourselves right now is so that we don't go the rest of our lives thinking that we are right with God if that is not the case, and then show up to Judgment Day and realize that in reality we were not right with God. Another example that we can see in that same situation is when we read the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. There, uh, the message goes directed to uh, the church in Philadelphia. And again, Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 and 17, or 15 through 17, it reads as follows. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot, so that because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. So when we think again as the reason to why we should examine ourselves, is to know where we, where, where we are standing before God. Whether or not we are walking in the light, or whether or not we are walking in darkness. And the Bible clearly tells us that if we are walking in the light, we have fellowship with God. But if we're walking in darkness, we are out of fellowship with God. So the first uh, point, again, that we wanted to touch on this lesson is to answer the question, why do I need to examine myself? So what we can learn in the scriptures is that it is important to examine ourselves to know where we stand with God. The second, the second point or the second question that we need to ask this afternoon is how do I examine myself? If we go back to, again, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and verse 5, we're going to look at the second part of that verse. Again, it said in the beginning, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. And then it says, prove your own selves. When I look at the original uh, Greek word that is used or is translated prove, the way that Thayer defines this word, he, he gives us two definitions. First, he says, it means to test, to examine, to prove to see whether a thing is genuine. And he applies that to metals, such as steel. Then the second definition that he gives us is to recognize as genuine 
after examination to prove or to deem worthy. Now, I want to, I guess because of my background, that I work as a mechanical engineer, and we deal with parts, with metals, different types of metals, and looking at that definition that Thayer gives us for the word to prove, and he says that that, that is used with the purpose of proving a, of whether or not a metal is genuine. So in engineering, a lot of the times they'll give us a task and they'll say, we need to design a component or a part that will go through, uh, that will receive certain loads, whether it's gonna go through a certain torque, twisting it, or it's something that you will compress, or it's something that you will pull. When we are told the different loads, what forces they will apply to that component, then the next thing that we need to figure out is, okay, so now I know the loads that they're putting into that component, so I need to figure out the best geometry, the verse form that I can design that component so that in combination with that form and the mechanical and chemical properties of that metal, then I can know whether or not that component will last all the, t all the time or, or serve the function that it's supposed to serve. Now you will think, or you will probably ask, how is that relevant to the uh, definition that we have here? Well, because also in engineering, when you have a failure and that component that you design breaks, then you have to go through a process of investigation. The first thing you do, then you go back and you look at your geometry, whether or not that component was manufactured in the way that it was supposed to, the lengths, diameters, any features that go on there. That is the form or the geometry of that, fe that feature. If everything checks out, then you move on to the next one. What, what else could have caused the failure? Well, was that material that we were using genuine? Meaning, did the chemistry of that material, every single element that makes up that material or that metal, was it in the proper percentages? Meaning, was it the proper metal, was it genuine? And then not only that, but then we also look at mechanical properties, which is you apply certain loads and that material has to behave in a certain way. Now, let us apply all of that to uh, the lesson that we have this morning. Because it says that I need to examine myself. The question is, how do I do that? We just established that, for instance, in engineering or in metals, there are certain processes that you follow to figure out whether or not something is genuine. So how do you figure out, uh, or in examining yourself, how do you figure out whether or not you're a genuine Christian? And when we talk about a Christian, we talk about the definition that the New Testament gives us that a, new, that a Christian in the New Testament should be. How do we go about proving that we are, in fact, genuine Christians as the New Testament defines? Well, some of the things that we need to do, and some of the, uh, just as I explained right now, the first thing that we need to look at is that Christians also have a certain form, certain geometry, just like I said. And we will go into depth in a little bit more. So if we know that if, if Christians, we have taken the form or shape or the geometry that, want, that God wants us to take, then the next thing that we need to ask, do we have the chemical composition? Meaning, do we have the specific attributes that God wants a Christian to have? Not only do we have the form or shape that he wants us to have, but do we have the, the attributes that are essential for a person to be a Christian? And then number three, under loads or under certain conditions, do we behave in the way that we are expected to behave? And those are the three things that I want to look at as looking at the process on how we go about examining ourselves. So first, we need to make sure that we are fashioned in the shape or in the form that a Christian should be fashioned. And for that, I have two different scriptures that we can look at. First, we can look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, which uh, some of the speakers have already touched on this, on this verse. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it reads, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good 
and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, you notice that some of the speakers already said this morning that we as Christians, by the renewing of our mind through the knowledge of the scriptures, we are to begin to take a certain form, to be transformed into, God, into what God wants us to be. Now, what is the form that a Christian should take? We go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, and the scripture says that uh, as follows. But we all, with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord. So you see, God wants us to transform our lives or to conform ourselves to a certain image and the image that God wants us to have is the image of his son Jesus Christ so that is the form that the Christian should take or just like I mentioned in the beginning the geometry the shape or the form God wants us to be like Christ that is the shape that he wants us to have but then again now we move on to the second part there are certain certain attributes or specific set of attributes that make up a Christian now, I will not pretend to give you an exhaustive list, but rather some of the examples of the attributes that we need to have as Christian in order to prove that we are genuine Christians. First, we'll look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. And in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 8, one of the things that we notice is that as Christians, we are expected to begin growing from the moment that we obey the gospel. And what God wants to see is that once we begin with our faith in God, then to that we begin adding certain attributes that God will see in our lives and know that we are living that Christian life that he wants us to live. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5 through 8 says, And beside this, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we see here, again, just like I said a moment ago, is that what God is expecting out of me as a Christian is that as I continue to live the Christian life, I am adding certain attributes to my life, to my, to my character, that those are the attributes that describe or fall within the range of someone who really is a Christian according to the New Testament. Now, in order to add some more attributes to that list, we can go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and verse 23, where the, spirit, where the fruit of the Spirit is being uh, under consideration. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 says, but, be, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, temperance against such things, there is no law. Now, there is, like I mentioned a, a moment ago, there is definitely a lot more attributes that we could add to this list. But just like I said in the beginning, you need to have a geometry. Now you have certain chemical properties. Uh, again, as Christians, we have the form that God wants us to have. Now we have certain attributes that prove that we are indeed Christians of the New Testament. And then lastly, we need to have or we need to behave in a certain way during the course of our life uh, on this earth. And the way that God expects us to behave, some of the examples that we can look at, we can look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 17, that once we have, again, transformed into that shape or into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we have already started adding those attributes that God has already given us, then the third thing is that we need to start behaving in a certain way that God wants us to behave. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. It says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under, under foot of men, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set up on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, 
but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your, God, your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, another scripture that is connected with this one is when the Apostle Paul writes to the brethren in, Phil in, in Philippi. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, he is talking about something along the lines of being the light. And again, Philippians chapter 2 verse 15 says that, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom ye shined as lights in the world. Now, our behavior, again, should conform to the same example that we see of our Lord Jesus Christ and behave in the same manner that he behaved when he was on this earth. And to that, the Apostle Peter speaks a little bit more on that topic. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21 and 23, he says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. So what we have learned in the first two points or two questions that we have already asked is, number one, that the reason why we need to examine ourselves is to know where we are standing with God. Number two, we have looked at the scriptures that the way or the manner in which we examine ourselves is by looking at certain attributes, the form, and the behavior that we need to have as Christians. But now that brings us to the third question. What should I do after I examine myself? So if, if I have already done the first two things, I have taken the time to examine myself, I have looked at myself, and I know whether or not I'm reflecting the image of God. And if I know that I have the attributes that we just described, and then if I'm behaving in the exact same way that the Bible says that a Christian should behave, then I know that my standing is right before God. But if I examine myself and I find out that that is not the case, that I have things that I need to fix in my life, then that means that the, those things I need to do something about it and I need to do something about it now so that I do not find myself in the same situation that those of Matthew 7 that we were reading about earlier in the book of Revelation chapter 3. Now with that in mind, if we already examine ourselves, there is one of two things that we have to do. If we find again, like I said just a moment ago, if we find ourselves that we are faithful to God, that we are in good standing with God, then what we need to do is what we read in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 7 through 11. Notice that here, that here uh, he is talking to the church in Philadelphia, Revelation, chapter 3, verse 7 uh, through 11. He says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth, he and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept my word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Now when we look at the message that our Lord is giving to the church in Philadelphia. There are seven churches that are being discussed in chapter 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. And when we look at those seven churches or seven congregations, one of the things that we notice is that five of them had something that they needed to repent. They had something they needed to get fixed. But out of those seven, two of them, one being the congregation or the church that we just read about, 
God has nothing but good things to say about them. Now, in that process that he is describing everything they've done, how they have remained faithful, how they have stood for the truth and remained faithful to God under any situation, then notice what he says at the very end. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. What he's telling them is, if you, if you are standing or you're in good standing before God, then you need to remain or keep doing what you have been doing up until this moment. And then one thing he reminds them is that nobody can take away their crown. Nobody can take away their salvation, their victory. They can only lose it themselves if they decide to do so. That is the case with us. When we examine ourselves, and if we find out that we are in good standing with God, what we need to remember is that no one can take that away from us. The only one that can take that state of being right with God is only ourselves the moment that we decide to stop being faithful. And that is the first thing that we need to do after we examine ourselves. Now, again, the second option or the second possibility is that I do examine myself and I find out that I am not right with God. For that, I want you to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're not going to read verse 5, but we're going to begin with verse 1 and verse 2, because that's, that's part of the context of 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13 and verse 5. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. It says, this is the third time that I am coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you now, as if I were present the second time, and being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned, and to all other, that if I come again, I will not spare. Now when you combine Second Corinthians chapter, th chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, with what we just read in verse 5, that we need to examine ourselves, the implication, again, looking at some of the members in the church of Corinth, is that they needed to repent from their sins. Specifically, when you look at the last part of verse 2, when it says, I write to them which hereto have sinned. He is speaking to those that are, that are finding the, themselves in some type of sin. And not only to them, but to all others, just in case there are any others that begin to fall into any type of sin. So when we see that the very last sentence of that verse 2 says, And to all other, that if I come again, I will not spare. What does he mean by that? So that means that the whole reason he's asking them to examine themselves is so that they, if they already know, specifically those who are in sin, the implication here is that he is giving them an opportunity to repent and to apply self-discipline to themselves. Meaning that what the Apostle Paul is saying is, I'd rather you, out of your own will, repent and fix anything, repent from any sin that you have, so that when I come for the third time, it is not going to be my job again to get the two or three witnesses and have to apply the discipline myself. That is what is under consideration. Now, the problem is that when we talk about discipline, there's actually a book that I read uh, a couple years ago that is titled The Forgotten Commandment. And it has to do with the topic of discipline. Because that is a topic that, again, we don't hear very often from our pulpits. But that is exactly what Paul is telling the members of the church at Corinth, that that's what they needed to do, that if they find themselves that they are in sin, he is giving them the opportunity to repent and self-discipline before he actually gets to the congregation. Now imagine, brethren, if many of us or most of us applied self-discipline to each one of us, we would save a lot of work to faithful brethren, to preachers, to elders that are usually the ones that have to deal with matters of discipline inside the church. Now when we talk about discipline, I know that that is a broad uh, topic and there is much to say about it. But I just want to say these three things. When we talk about discipline in the Bible, we read in the scriptures and we know that there are at least three different forms or three different types of discipline. First, the Bible talks about instructive discipline. 
And that instructive discipline is the one that has in mind educating, training, building up, or giving instruction with the aim of increasing virtue. Now you can see that type of instructive discipline when we go to the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. In that part of the scripture, God is talking to Adam, and when he's talking to Adam, notice what God is doing. God tells Adam in the form of commandments, he gives him instructive discipline by telling him some of the things that he is allowed to do. He tells him you can eat of every fruit of every tree that you find in the garden. But then he gives one that he is not allowed to do, except for one tree, the one of the knowledge of good and evil. But notice that God doesn't just say you can do this and you cannot do that, but he gives them reasons as to why. He tells them, I don't want you to eat of that tree because the day that you do so, your eyes will be open, you will know the difference between good and evil, and you will die. So God is telling him again, in that instructive discipline, it includes the things that we're allowed to do, the things that we are not allowed to do, why we are not allowed to do them, and what will happen if we end up doing them. That is instructive discipline. That's the one that forms and shapes and strengthens us so that we are doing what God wants us to do. That, again, is what we find in Matthew chapter 18, verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse, verse 20, chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. How do you make disciples? Well, you go and preach the gospel. You uh, bring them into Christ. They are baptized for the remission of their sins, but it doesn't stop there. Then we have to teach them all everything that the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching when he was on earth and everything else that has been revealed through the Holy Spirit. So that is the job, that we have to give instructive discipline, to, I mean, instructive discipline to every member of the church so that we all know how we should live our Christian lives. Then comes the second type of discipline, which is corrective discipline. That is the discipline or another of the definitions that Thayer gives us for that one is that it cultivates the soul specifically or especially by correcting mistakes and curving passions. Now, where do we find that type of corrective discipline? Well, we go back to the book of Genesis. But now in chapter 4 and verse 5 through 7, you remember Cain and Abel came to offer a sacrifice before God. One was accepted, one was not. What was the reaction of Cain? Well, he gets upset. And God asks him, why are you upset? Why are you mad that you were not uh, accepted? And then God tells him, if you did the right thing, if you would have done the right thing, or if you do the right thing after this, wouldn't you be accepted? So what God is saying is you need to correct what you did wrong. Now, knowing God, we know that when he gives a commandment, especially when it came to the offering, God has never left it up to man for him to decide how he will render service to God. God is always specific in those matters. And that tells us that Cain, when he, offered his, uh, he brought his offering, he didn't do it according to the commandments of God, and that's why he was rejected. Now, if he was rejected, now God is giving him an opportunity to correct that mistake. You can come back, and you can do it again, and then you will be accepted. All you have to do is just do it right the second time. But then God gives him a warning. But if you don't do that, if you don't fix what you did wrong the first time, sin is at the door. Meaning you can end up sinning even more than you have already done. That is corrective discipline. Because in corrective discipline, not only did God tell Cain what he did wrong, but he tells him how to correct it, how to make it right. And that is corrective discipline. Now, the third form of discipline that we find in the Bible, that is punitive discipline. And just as the name implies, that brings that there is some form or type of punishment after there has been instructive discipline and then corrective discipline, and now we find ourselves in punitive discipline. So what that means now is that we can go back to Cain and see how he was a recipient of God's punitive discipline. We know what he did after God had already told him what he had done wrong and how he needed to fix it. But he goes on, and you and I know what he did. He goes and kills his brother, adding more sin to what he already had. So when he comes back or God talks to him about where is his brother, 
then we see the punishment that God inflicts on Cain for what he did. And what I notice is that there in Genesis chapter 4, 10 through 14, there is a part where he is punished, and he says this. He says, my, punish, my punishment is greater than I can bear. He realizes that now that he finds himself a recipient of God's punitive discipline, he realizes that that is something very difficult to go through. So when we think about uh, us, us as Christians, and we go back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, that we are to examine our, our, ourselves unless ye be reprobates. reprobates. What that means is that if we are not right before God, we have the option to correct any sin that we have in our lives on our own. You and I should be able to analyze ourselves. You and I should be able to know whether or not we're standing, uh, how we're standing before God. And you and I should know whether or not we are in fellowship with God. And if we know that we are not, it is our own responsibility to correct anything that we are doing wrong. That should be the responsibility of every Christian. That is a responsibility of every Christian. Again, because when we don't do that, then we are forcing, again, faithful brethren in the congregation or elders or preachers to have to be the ones that have to come and apply either corrective or punitive discipline when we remain in our sin. So going back to what we have learned or looking at a better example of how this corrective discipline should be done on our own, which is what the Apostle Paul wanted from the brethren in Corinth, we can look at the example of the prodigal son. You remember he left his father? But there is something that we see in that example that he gives us. When he is at his lowest and he has nothing to eat, he realizes that the situation that he put himself into. He remembers back how his situation was before he left his father's house. He looks at himself then when he is at the lowest point in his life. He realizes everything that he has lost, but then at that time he's meditating. And he says, this is what I need to do. I need to go back to my father's house, and this is what I need to tell him. The boy that came back or the son that came back was a completely different person than the person that left the first time. It was a person that because of the discipline, the trials that God gave him, he was able to realize not only the wrong that he had done, but he came back in a mental state or in a state of mind that now he is willing to be a humble person and to, to be obedient to his, to his father. And that is the purpose of us examining ourselves, that if we find ourselves to be in some type of sin, we need to repent from that sin. We need to do it just like the prodigal son did so that we can be right with God. So again, just as a summary, we have answered three different questions to the topic that has been assigned this afternoon. Examine yourselves. We have realized that, one, the reason why we need to examine ourselves is because we need to know what our situation is before God. Second, we have looked at the form or the way in which we are to examine ourselves, and that's for us to realize that we have taken the form that God wants us to take, if we have the attributes that God wants us to have, and if we are behaving in the way that a Christian should behave according to the New Testament. And finally, by answering the third question, we have realized that we have one of two possibilities. Either we continue to live our faithful lives before Christ and not lose our salvation, or we correct anything that is wrong in our lives to bring us back into fellowship with God. This evening, if there is someone uh, amongst us that is not yet a Christian and has not obeyed the gospel, we invite you as well to do so at this time. Thank you for your time.